Thanks very much, Camille, for the invitation and for the opportunity to be back at the Col Normal. Uh, it's really a very, very nice visit. Uh, I started by talking about different routes, trying to classify the different ways that for we form strongly correlated materials, but then I changed to a slightly more general title in which I'll try to explain where we are in sort of the grand scheme of things, trying to build a predictive theory of strongly correlated electron matter. So let me sort of tell you a little bit about condensed matter physics for sort of a general audience. Like here, we really know the Hamiltonian, what the Hamiltonian is on an atomic scale. So if we start with an energy scale of 10 eb or one Rydberg, we know exactly where the atoms are, which type of atoms we have, what type of constituents we have in our material. But the challenge is to go to much lower energy scales and try to describe the low energy properties, say on a scale of 10 or 100 Kelvin. Uh, and that's sort of going to be the general theme of this talk. I'll re and I'll try to tell you where we are in, in these efforts. So the reason why this problem is challenging, even though we know what is the Hamiltonian, is because we're dealing with multiple energy scales and we're dealing with emergent phenomena, namely things that happen at low energies where sort of new, where the degrees of freedom rearrange themselves and can have result in new properties such as, for example, high temperature superconductivity or metal to insulator transitions or many interesting types of ordering. So that's sort of our challenge. And the second challenge that we have in condensed matter theory is that we are in close contact with experiments, which is actually a big boon because it helped guide our efforts. So to start this sort of talk, I'll start with a very, very basic question and ask, well, what have we achieved in the 20th century? Why, why do we really feel that we really understand very well simple materials such as silicon or copper or alumina? So those are things that are sort of at the basis of our technology and we really understand them and understood them very well in the 20th century based on quantum mechanics, but we still have interacting electrons. So the reason why we understand them is because of two really important developments. One is sort of due to Landau. It's what's called the Landau Fermi liquid theory. And it says that if we look, if we sort of take systems which are metallic and have sort of a Fermi surface, and we sort of eliminate all the high energy electrons and focus on a surface, on, on electrons near the Fermi surface, then the strong Coulomb interactions we operate at short distances, in fact, renormalize away. They sort of go away, and we are left at low energies with essentially Hamiltonian or actions which describe essentially free electrons. And that's the basis of our textbooks of solid state physics, where we really portray the electrons in the solids as waves which are propagating freely in, in, in a crystal in the presence of the periodic potential. And one consequence of that is that while the electrons are interacting, their lifetime is actually very, very long and the, the, the decay rate goes to zero as we approach the Fermi surface. And now this has been put on very rigorous footing based on renormalization group ideas, and it can be actually proved mathematically that at least in three dimensions, this picture is completely correct. So that's one leg in which our understanding of solids is based, which says that at low energies, and low in copper means one electron volt, so it's sort of actually very high energies, and we can treat the electrons as being essentially non-interacting, taking the interactions as a weak perturbation. The second pillar of our understanding is due to Hohenberg, Kohn, and Sham, and it's what's called the density functional theory, which in fact, it's powerful because it gives us way to actually compute properties. And it says that for the purpose of computing the density of a solid, we can think of solving a Schrodinger-like one particle equation with a potential which is depending itself in the density. So this is like Hartree type of equations, but there is such a potential that if we would plug it here, 
it would give us the exact density of the solid. And this is completely first principles if we knew this functional of the density. The only input is the crystal potential, namely what type of atoms we have and what their position is. So this is called the density functional theory and there are now good approximations for this functional of rho and the reason why it's powerful is because even though this gives us the exact density in principle and even though this system of equations is sort of a system of auxiliary equations in the sense that these wave functions are not the true excitations of the solid, it turns out that for the weakly correlated materials this set of equations give us a good approximation to the excitations, to the lambda quasi particles of, this, of the solid. And this is sort of how we compute band structure in the solids and we can compare these band structures with photoemission experiments where you add or remove electrons in the solid. So the reason why we know that this is a good reference system, this is a good starting point for understanding solids is we can take that as the zeroth order and then just do first order perturbation theory in the screen Coulomb interactions and then compute the real excitations of the solid, the poles of the Green's function that gives us the Landau quasi particles. This is called GW method, the name is not so important but we just do first order perturbation theory in the screen Coulomb interactions and after we do that completely from first principles we can compute things. So this is just to give you an example how far people have gone in the description of semiconductors. In this plot which is from the Berkeley group of Stephen Louis, we have the experimental band gap, the theoretical band gap, this is what happens if we just solve this system of equations, it's called LDA. It sort of underestimates the gap but has the right trends. Then we do the first order perturbation theory and the theory and the experiment are very close. Deviations of the order of 10%. So for the purpose of really uh, understanding and predicting trends, this is perfect in this class of systems and I take that as the definition of the weakly correlated materials. Those are the ones where we're sort of one small step away from this system, this reference system of the density functional theory. Okay, so now does it really work and what are the consequences? Well, one consequence which is going to be very important in the sequel is that the resistivity of simple metals at low temperatures has to go as the temperature square. That's what, uh, the, and this is sort of the resistivity of something like copper and at very low temperatures indeed it goes like Landau said as T square. And then if we look at it at higher temperatures then there is the electron scatter of the phonons and we have a linear resistivity. But the important thing is that the resistivity of weakly correlated systems is always small. Small compared to what? Well, small compared to what's called the mott joffe regel limit, which is 100 microohm centimeters. Where does it come from? Well, it comes from the fact that the basic assumption of all this theory is that the electron is a wave. A wave which has a wavelength which is of the order of the inverse Fermi wave vector, and then every now and then it scatters because either decays or it gets scattered by the phonon, which defines a mean free path. And the mean free path times Kf is the mean free path divided by the wavelength and the mean free path of a wave has to be much longer than the wavelength and for the theory to make sense so this number Kfl has to be very large which means that the resistivity has to be always very small, small smaller in 3D materials than my, the mod Joffer regel limit and indeed in copper, here we have six microohm centimeters at the melting point of copper, so it's much less than this number. So that's sort of how weakly correlated materials work. And the reason why we're so sure that they really work is because now we can stand on the second leg of the standard model of solids, which is the Kohn-Sham density functional theory, which gave Walter Kohn the Nobel Prize and compute from first principles the resistivity not only of copper but from all the other transition metals and again here we take all the transition metal series this is work of Sergei Savrasov and uh, basically you see that pretty much from all the transition metals 
from vanadium all the way to palladium, the theory and the experiment, and here there are no adjustable parameters because those are density functional theory calculations are in good agreement with experiments. Where there are disagreements, we even understand where they come from, come from subleading effects, from spin fluctuations, which are very important in systems such as palladium. So those are the weakly correlated systems, and that's sort of the reference. The question and the challenge for, for the, the 21st century is that there are many, many materials where this framework, which is so well defined and makes so much sense and works so well, does not really apply. And to motivate that, I'll just look at resistivities of many different materials and show you that they have no problems exceeding this mod Joffe regal limit. So the, remember, the mod Joffe regal limit was here, like 100 microohms centimeters. So it would be here, or it would be here, or it would be here. So there are many, many metals which have absolutely no problems having resistivities which are huge. And if you want to interpret them in terms of a wave picture, this doesn't make any sense because they have a wavelength which is of the same order or even longer than the mean free path, which it, 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 it's nonsensical. So that's sort of a problem. And people started to pay attention to this problem in the context of the copper oxides. I mean, that was a material which was surprisingly this was surprising because the critical temperature for the superconductivity was unexpectedly high. But the, that was sort of like, it's, it's a sideshow. The, 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 the difficulty is that the normal state of all these materials, including the copper oxides, have, cannot be interpreted in terms of the standard model of solids, which posits that we have well-defined quasi-particles. So, I call this the condensed matter theory fine-tuning problem for the following reason. All these systems at sufficiently low temperatures, they do exhibit Fermi-liquid behavior. So there is, if I look here at very low temperatures, there is a nice resistivity scaling with the square. So rho goes as t square, but the validity of this t square law, the validity of the Fermi-liquid theory is tiny. There is very, very different, very little room in temperature for this t square behavior. So there is a scale, there is a Fermi liquid scale. There, I ultimately flow towards the Fermi liquid fixed point that we understand, but throughout most of the observable regimes, the physics is not controlled by Fermi liquid quasi particles, it's controlled by something else. And the challenge is to find a way of describing this regime. And this is not just compounds. Here I just took all the elemental actinides, starting from uh, uh, curium and ending with plutonium, which also have very large resistivities. And the reason why I put it this way is to show you that yes, Fermi liquid theory works, but one has to fine tune something if you want to explain why all these materials are, have such a low Fermi liquid scale. So, what I will tell you about is how we approach this problem. I'll give you a general introduction to correlated materials. I'll try to explain where you, where you will find the behavior as shown. Then I will tell you the approach that we've been following over many years, which is something which is called dynamic amine field theory, which provides a non-perturbative avenue to address the strong correlation problem in solids, and then uh, in fact, uh, I, we wrote a review with Antoine Georges in very early on when, uh, and I had a very nice visit, I think it was about 20 years ago in Ecole Normale where we were working on that review. And we'll tell you, based on this dynamic amine field theory, how we can understand strong correlations and different physical pictures of where this comes from. One is mod physics. But I'll show you that the most general one does not come from Mott, but actually comes from Huns. And what I will be doing is I will trace the atomic physics, like the Huns term of the mott hubbard term, to the low energy physics using this DMFT approach. 
And if I have time, there's a third route, which is called heavy fermion physics. And I'll show you, I think these are the three ways that a material can become strongly correlated. And we'll understand also why these scales, what these Fermi liquid scales are so low. And we'll also understand where these large resistivities come from. And then I will conclude. OK, so let's get started. And by the way, feel free to stop me at, uh, at any points and ask questions. There are students in the audience. Oh. OK, so what are the strongly correlated electrons? Why do we care about? Well, I told you already, those are materials where the standard model, which is based on Fermi liquid theory and the density functional theory as a computational tool, doesn't work. And we're interested because over the years have done many interesting things. This problem is very old. It started in the 60s and the 70s when people observed in some oxides, such as the vanadium oxide, that it can have metal insulator transitions. These are materials which have odd number of electrons, if you want, in the unit cell. And therefore, if you just do a band theory, your chemical potential is always inside a band. So in principle, cannot have ins insulating behavior. So the, indeed, this was the first the first materials where people felt, well, interactions somehow do not renormalize to zero in these systems. There has to be something else that is happening. And uh, uh, those are metal insulator transitions, large changes in resistivity. Then in the 70s and the 80s, people discovered some materials which are called heavy fermions, which are characterized by having extremely heavy Fermi liquids. So I told you there is a scale, which is the Fermi liquid scale. And below that scale, they have masses as, or, as large as 100 or 1,000 times the mass of the electrons. Because Fermi liquid theory tells you that you have free electron form of the action near the Fermi level. It doesn't tell you what the parameters are. And these very large masses was something very surprising that attracted a lot of attention. Then in the 80s and the 90s, as a result of the discovery of uh, uh, 100 Kelvin superconductivity in the copper oxides, enormous attention was devoted to this problem. And there was enormous interest in studying oxides. And lots of oxides with giant effects were discovered, giant thermoelectric power, giant, giant magnetoresistance, and so on. And it's sort of not surprising that these materials give rise to large effects because they're not limited to weak coupling physics around the Fermi surface. So pretty much changes at the atomic scale result in big perturbations, in big results at low energies. And the most recent discovery in this field is that the fact that iron-based systems, which normally you think of iron as being magnetic, can also exhibit high temperature superconductivity, now as high as 100 Kelvin. And I will take this as the example to illustrate the sort of the, the state of the art of dynamic amine field theory. Now, how do we make the correlated materials? Well, this is something that was sort of understood already by Mott. There is a regions of the periodic table where we have atoms with open shells. So those are the constituents of the strongly correlated systems. We have to start with atoms which have active degrees of freedom. So we can take 3D, 4D, 4F, 5F. Everywhere in the periodic table that you have open shells, you're likely to form uh, correlated compounds. and uh, then if the electrons overlap a lot, then the kinetic energy is the most important term in the Hamiltonian. And then you renormalize towards the Fermi liquid. So if you want to avoid that, you have to put the electrons sufficiently far apart from each other. For that, you sort of put them in cages with some ligands. And there you go. You st stack them or layer them, and you have a strongly correlated compound. And when you do that, you will get something interesting. And just as an example, I'll just run you through the 3D series. If you just do vanadium, you will have a room, a room temperature metal insulator transition. You can use that to make smart windows that can reflect the heat. If you take manganese, you have colossal magnetoresistance. Then if you take lithium, uh, if you take cobalt, this is the material that you have in your, in, in your pocket. That's what you use in order to make uh, cell phone batteries. Uh, 
Uh, finally, if you take copper, you can make high temperature superconductors by that prescription. So pretty much what you do leads to strong correlations via this, the, 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 this recipe. And the challenge is, was realized early on by, by Neville Mott, who really pointed out that essentially we have two limiting cases of the electronic structure problem. You have the textbook case where the electrons can easily form bands because the atoms are really overlapping. And you have the case where the atoms are very well separated from each other. Uh, 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 and then, basically, you can describe that as an isolated collection of atoms. But the strongly correlated materials are in between. And almost by construction, and then there's really challenging to describe them because you cannot do perturbation theory either in the bands or in the atoms. And you cannot match the spectra because the spectra of multiplets of the atoms is qualitatively different of the spectrum of the bands which are described, say, in density functional theory. So not being able to do perturbation theory either in this or that, by definition, you cannot do perturbation theory in the bands because that's the region where the perturbation is very, very strong. It does not renormalize to zero. You cannot do perturbation theory here because you're starting with a highly degenerate state. So this has sort of led to a lot of efforts and many, many approaches trying to guess the form of the theory that is needed to be described to describe the strong correlation in metals has been proposed. This is an effort that continues till now. And what I will sort of tell you is something that I felt for a long time that what we needed is a reference frame, just like the Consham system is a good way to start describing the, 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 the weakly correlated materials. We need an alternative frame, which is not based on, on the wave picture, and that captures both bands and atoms, these two endpoints that Sir Neville Mott told us we should take very, very seriously. Now we have this framework. It's called dynamic amine field theory. And I want to explain to you next sort of the key ideas of DMFT, which is something that I invented together with Antoine Georges when Antoine was in the States. And it's a very, very simple idea from, for, for, for people who worked on statistical mechanics uh, and involves what any mean field theory does, which is to reduce a many body problem, say something on the lattice, to a single site problem, but in an effective medium. And uh, classically, what you do is you take something like the Ising model, for example, and then you say, OK, I want to describe just this spin. And we will describe that by replacing all the other spins by an effective field. Now, the problem is that we don't have a classical problem. We have some quantum mechanical Hamiltonian. And what I'm putting here is the simplest Hamiltonian. It's called the Hubbard Hamiltonian. has some hopping term, describes S electrons which hop quantum mechanical in the lattice, and then it has an on-site interaction U. Now, but we can follow the idea of classical vice theory. So you would just take the Hamiltonian, keep all the on-site terms, and replace all the other ones by a medium. In the classical case, is a spin. In the quantum case, you have to write an action because you have to keep the quantum mechanics intact. But all you need to do is keep, sit at one side, Keep the on-site terms that you had. This term is on-site, so you keep it. The chemical potential is on-site, you keep it. The hopping between different sites, you replace by a function which describes all the virtual hops of the electron into a bath and coming back. And just like this is the vice field for a classical problem, this is the vice field for the quantum problem. And it just describes the ability of the electron to hop back and forth. And it's just basically the quantum mechanical order parameter for the localization, the localization transition. When the electron is atomic-like, this is very small, and you have an isolated atom. When the electron can hop very easily, this becomes essentially large, and the electron delocalizes. And then there's a self-consistency condition that determines means what's the optimal hybridization, what's the optimal delta. And basically, it requires that this site is equivalent to all the other sites. So you compute the self-energy with this action, you compute the local Green's function with this action, you ask that it's the same, that determines your delta. 
And basically, that's the dynamic mean field construction for a model. And what has happened is that now we understand this much better, and we've extended it to many other quantities. So we have, this is called an impurity model. It's an atom in a medium, which is the reference frame for describing the lattice. And with this, this is still a quantum mechanical problem, but it's a quantum mechanical problem that we can solve. That's what I call truncation. We truncated the lattice to, a, to an atom in a bath. Then we compute things with the impurity. We compute the self-energy. We compute, if we want susceptibilities, we compute vertex functions. And then we embed them to get the observable quantities. And this is the spin susceptibility. This is the one electron Green's function. All this can be measured and be, can, can be computed and we can sort of proceed and compare with experiments. But of course, this was done so far in a model. But this idea of truncation and embedding can be carried out very generally to make this into a first principle method. Because now, you can think now in terms of a shell. You just pick the correlated shell of the solid. And you take all the other electrons into account using the potential, for example, like the density functional theory. So you treat most of the electrons a la density functional theory by some effective potential, which depends on the density and which can self-consist. And then we embed a self-energy from the impurity to describe the effects that fall outside perturbation theory, the things that are needed to regain the atomic physics. This is called LDA plus DMFT, and now is essentially a method which does not require too much knowledge because there are ways of computing the effective parameters of this shell, and uh, one can, from the knowledge of the atomic positions, one can try to make predictions about what the solids do. Okay, the other reason why this is sort of important is not only because it allows us to compute things, but it also allows us to understand things. This, this atom in a bath plus a coupling between the atom and the bath has a long history in condensed matter physics, for example, standing for, with Kondo, and it describes sort of how the system ev evolves as a function of scale. That was actually one of the first motivators for Ken Wilson to, to, to develop the renormalization group. And uh, there are many now, many different types of impurity Hamiltonians. This is called the Kondo model, where the local atom has only spin. This is what's called the, the Anderson impurity Hamiltonian. And here we have up, down, empty, uh, and doubly occupied as, as the local degrees of freedom of the atom. And one can think of much more general models. And there have been many, many advances on how to treat this type of problem. Now this can be actually solved essentially exactly. Um, the mean field theory can be used to study also broken symmetry states. All we need to do is just like in vice mean field theory for magnets, we can assume that each site does something different. This method becomes exact if the coordination of the lattice is large and the hoppings is scale like one over the square root of the dimensionality. This is a limit that was introduced by Dieter Folhar and Walter Metzner. And it's very important because it says that the results of these calculations are exact in a limit where both kinetic energy and on-site repulsion are both of order one. So it can describe the physics of strong correlations. Just like in StatMech, these things can be extended uh, uh, and treat clusters of one side, two sides, four sides, and see how well things are described. We can also do that now for, for, for this quantum mechanical problem. And last but not least, I said this problem is non-perturbative, but one can identify a class of graphs that this is summing exactly. And it's summing all the local graphs, the graphs where the Green's function is zero away to, from so, two sides, but is of order one on site. And it sums in a very well-defined way, thanks to these impurity models, even though the sum formally is a diverging sum. So it gives sense to how one should resum the perturbation theory. OK, so that's basically the end of the introduction. Now, 
about the experiments, there have been a lot of developments for measuring, for seeing what the electrons are doing, and that has been driving the field. One in very important tool is called the photoemission, where you actually use the photoelectric effect to shine light and extract the electrons from the solid, and it, it measures the one particle Green's function of the solid. So in the weakly correlated system, you can use that to map those bands of the Consham theory. In the, for a general material, when the quasi-particle assumption breaks down, what it describes is how the electron is split between various different excitations. So it's something that uh, we can actually compare our calculations against. So that's basically uh, experiments, that's photoemission, and there are many other tools that probe the strong correlation state. For example, we'll rely a lot on optics, which measures the excitation spectrum at q equal to zero, and neutron scattering, which measures what are the spins of uh, particle hole excitations. And all of them will be compared with the MFT results. Okay, so now, Let's go and describe the various routes to strong correlation behavior, starting with the first problem of strongly correlated electrons, the vanadium oxide. This is sort of the phase diagram. It has this composition here tunes the chemical pressure. This vanadium oxide is a metal, but you expand the lattice a little bit and it becomes an insulator. Uh, um, uh, and uh, basically this is called the mod transition and the basic physics can be understood already by thinking of atoms. If you have an on-site term which is u times n square then basically you favor occupancies of zero or two. So, um, sorry, you favor occupancies of n equals to one and you penalize occupancies of zero or two. This costs energy. So to form a metal, we want to fluctuate between these configurations and we have to create these configurations which are penalized. If this U is very large, this process gets blocked. Each electron sits in its own site and becomes an insulator. So when this interaction is very large, we have insulator. When this is very small, we have hopping, hopping, we have hopping processes and then we have a metal. So that's basically the key idea of the mott hubbard mechanism, and it operates in vanadium oxide, and you can think of the Mott insulator as a traffic jam where each electron just sits in its own site and just doesn't move because there's a penalty from moving from one site to the other. So that's basically Mott physics, and for a long time that was considered to be the, 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 the most important mechanism for understanding strong correlations, and it was proximity to the mod transition that was believed to be the, ma the major source of strong correlations. And this was really the first uh, advance of dynamic mean field theory. In this simple Hubbard model with enough frustration at half filling, it produced a phase diagram which was very similar to the vanadium oxide, enables us to understand this mod physics and what happens to the electron when, when, when you just sort of move through this phase diagram, how you go from a Fermi liquid for small u at very low temperatures to a paramagnetic insulator where the charge is blocked and you have a gap in the spectra continuously or through a first order phase transition. And the low energy scales, the low energy Fermi liquid scale comes if you fine tune to be very near the MOT transition. So that was sort of a, 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 the first success of the MFT. And basically, it led to some experimental predictions. And what are the experimental predictions? Well, that was based on very, very early model calculations, but it was very clear that the optical conductivity has to get suppressed on broad energy scales as you approach the MOT insulator state. So this is uh, when you're far from the transition, and this is when you're close to the transition. And the thing that was interesting is that the conductivity was suppressed not only at low frequencies, but on a broad frequency range. So small changes in parameters, here we're thinking of temperature changes, uh, which are small between 300 and 170 Kelvin, 
produce a suppression of spectral weight on a scale of 10,000 uh, Kelvin, like one electron volt. So that was sort of a, a, a prediction of the theory, and this was sort of the experimental observation on the vanadium oxide, the, which was done by the group of Gordon Thomas at Bell Labs. And now these experiments have been redone many, many times. This is recent results by the group in Rome. But you see in much more detail this dramatic suppression of spectral weight as a function of temperature when you get to the close to the mod transition because the charge is blocked. And now we can do first principle calculations. This is actually real vanadium oxide with LDA plus DMFT in collaboration with the experimental group of Dmitry Basov, now in Columbia University. And again, we see the same effect, this suppression of kinetic energy over a broad energy range. So I would say that we sort of understand the essence of mod physics. It's charge blocking, is close to an insulating state, it gives rise to temperature-dependent electronic structure, and we can see that in the conductivity. It leads to low energy scales, and I don't have time to explain, but there is also a hidden Fermi liquid even at high temperatures in, in, in this data. But that, I believe, is not the main road for strong correlations. It's one road, but there are others. And the second road is what I call Hund's physics, and that was only understood recently, and it came about because of a surprising discovery by the group of Hosono in Japan, who actually was working in an applied physics setting, trying to find transparent semiconductors. So transparent semiconductors are very useful because you can use them to make a screen in your laptop and to be able to write using your finger by using capacitive coupling. So he had a well-founded problem, a program to study that, but by chance, when he was studying iron arsenide, which is close to being semiconducting, he found that this actually turns into a superconductor, even though the active ingredients here are layers of iron and arsenic. So that was sort of a discovery, a very important discovery. And since then, the critical temperatures in these materials has increased up to 100 Kelvin which is very, very remarkable for a material which is based on a magnetic element such as iron, and there are many, many families of this. But this was discovered in 2008, and this was sort of a, the first time really that we had methods that could calculate materials starting from first principles, and it was sort of challenging to see what the method would give. So immediately after the discovery, uh, Jihun Shim and Christian Haule at Rutgers tested LDA plus DMFT on this compound that had been discovered. And the results were interesting. First, the prediction was that phonons could not give rise to the superconductivity because the coupling was very weak. But more important, the masses, the effective masses of the electrons are enhanced by a factor of three to five and that's a symptom of correlations. A, a you remember the density functional theory was like our zeroth order thing. And then on top of that, we add the dynamic amine field theory. When the changes are dramatic of the order of three to five, then we're way outside the region where the perturbation theory works. And we can declare that this material is strongly correlated. And then there were optical measurements showing that the optical mass indeed was uh, about three. This is uh, this quantity I've been talking about, which is the integral of the spectral weight, which is a measure of the inverse effective mass relative to the LDA. And this was of the order of one third, which was roughly where we had suggested it would be. So that was sort of the first thing. But then comes the interesting part. When you can describe a material computationally, you can actually ask questions that the experimentalists cannot. And in this case, what we ask is the question, where do the correlations come from? And we can do something that the experimentalists cannot do, which is vary independently the different parameters of these LDA plus DMFT calculations away from the physical values. And then something very interesting happened we found that this effective mass or the resistivity was essentially insensitive to the Hubbard U, uh, 
So this material was not close to a mod transition, but was is very, very sensitive to the Huns J. If you set J equal to zero, even though the Hubbard U is of the order of the bandwidth, the material has absolutely no resistivity. And it's extremely sensitive to the Huns coupling of the atom. Now, we sort of found for the physical values of J, this material had a coherence in coherence crossover, which was also seen experimentally. And once again, I want to stress that these materials are very nice, are very pure, and at low temperatures, they are Fermi liquids. So this is the resistivity as a function of T square. And you see that at very low temperatures, it has the perfect T square law. In fact, it extrapolates to a tiny constant. So this material is more pure than actually copper. Copper was one microohm centimeters. But then you look at the material at room temperature, and the resistivity here is like five times the mod limit. So this cannot possibly be described in terms of a wave picture. This is really a very, very strongly compound, which is away from the sort of the Fermi liquid miles away because the, the wave description, the quasi-particle description, does not apply in the interesting temperature regime. Of course, at very low temperatures, in this, this compound becomes superconducting. OK, so where does this thing come from? To understand that, we have now a hint. So we need to look at an atom, which is a little bit more sophisticated. It has not just the U term that Hubbard told us to write down, but also the, the, the Huns J, which promotes very, very high spin. And this has a very profound effect, especially in the D6 configuration, which is the configuration of iron. Because if you have a D5, the configuration is such that you occupy all the D orbitals to maximize the spin. That's the Huns rule. And there are no active orbital degrees of freedom left. But when you are D6, you try to maximize the spin, but there is an active orbital. Also, the levels of the atom actually go towards each other. So the actual gap between the excitations that you need to make the metal are actually decreased by J instead of increased by J. So J promotes metallicity. It destroys the mod Hubbard gap and leaves uh, an orbital degree of freedom. And that's something that was understood early on by Zawadzki, who examined the effects of Huns coupling in solids in a pioneering paper. And there was something else that was also known that once you have these very high spins and these orbital degrees of freedom, the ability to screen that is highly hindered. So this gives rise also to extremely low energy scales. And that was known in the context of the Kondo effect. So this is a famous plot of the 60s, it was studied actually by Bob Schrieffer, which plots the screening scale of the moments across the transition metal series. And then this is a logarithmic scale. So this scale, which is called the Kondo scale, gets extremely low when you get close to the half-field shell, for example, for iron. So this can be actually exponentially small. So there were all these ingredients, but uh, what we sort of understood now is that when we put these two things together, you put the impurity, you put the mean field theory, and now you start forming these resonances, then these have extremely low Fermi liquid scales. And above this Fermi liquid scale, we have a strongly non-perturbative behavior. So this was sort of a very hand-waving picture. If we really want to make a theory of Hunsness, then um, uh, one needs actually to study a, 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 an impurity model, which now has not only the spin degrees of freedom, but also the orbital degrees of freedom. And this is work that has only been done very, very recently. And then one can actually study the full renormalization group flow, starting from the atom, ending with the very, very, very low regime of Fermi liquid theory, and find that, in fact, there are two scales. One scale where these orbital degrees of freedom gets absorbed by the conduction band, but the spin still remains free. And then a second scale where the Fermi liquid the theory forms.
So we have a big window here where the orbital degrees of freedom of the atom have undergone a delocalization and they're completely itinerant, but the spin degrees of freedom are still localized. And that's what we call the Huns metal. And uh, this is not tied to the proximity of to any critical point. So this is sort of the generic strong correlation behavior that one was looking for. So now let me show you some experiments and some, some confirmation that this is actually true. So this was sort of what I call theoretical photoemission. Why theoretical photoemission is because we compute the same quantity that, that, that experimentalists do. And basically what we see is things that look like bands, but they're very anomalous. At low temperatures, you see here, there's a band that crosses the Fermi level. Then if we heat the system to room temperature, this thing essentially goes away. So if we look at the density of states, this is sort of this quasi-particle peak, which has a well-defined orbital symmetry. When you heat it up, this thing goes away, and you're just left with some broad incoherent background. And this is sort of experiments uh, done by uh, Hongding's group in, uh, in China, but there are other experiments that also were carried out in, in similar systems. And one sees the same thing. At low temperatures, you see a clear band crossing. Then as you increase the temperature, this slowly eventually fades away. So these are sort of new excitations, new bound states of the spin and, uh, and, uh, uh, and the charge and the orbital that form these coherent quasi-particles. This is in the Fermi liquid regime below 20 Kelvin. Around room temperature, there's no trace of these excitations. You just had some broad incoherent background, but still the material is metallic rather than insulating. Okay, so that's sort of one example how we probe this experimentally. The other way that we can probe it is with spin spectroscopy. This is really a tour de force by Ziping Yin, who is now a professor in, in Beijing Normal University, where he actually evaluated theoretically the neutron scattering cross-section, S of Q and omega, which tells you where the spin excitations are distributed in frequency and wave vector. And this is very important because we have essentially localized spins in a metal. So we have excitations that look like spin waves, but they are not spin waves because we have the orbital degrees of freedom completely itinerant. And wherever we could compare with experiments, there was good agreement with experiments, at least on the scale of uh, 0.2 EV, which is sort of the, 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 the scales, 0.3 EV, the scales of the spin fluctuation measurements. And let me show you, for example, in the iron selenide, the, the, this was sort of a prediction. Uh, and, it, and I choose that because this is a case where the predictions were not so great, and it gives you an idea of where we are with this method. So we sort of predicted that there would be spin fluctuations around pi pi and there will be spin fluctuations around pi zero. This was extremely low energy. And then eventually this thing was measured, so let's compare it. So this thing around uh, 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 0.2 EV was fine. Uh, this was roughly where the theory said it, it would be, um, around 100 MeV. You have intensity. This is around 100 MeV, and this is what's near pi pi, so that was good. And this was around pi zero, which again was okay, but here there's a small gap that opens at low energies that was not in the theory. The gap is around 0.05 uh, uh, EV. So when we get to energies of 50 Kelvin, we don't have so much predictive power, but for what this method is without free parameters, I consider this to be a great success of the theory. And sort of, uh, I have like five minutes left. Uh, so let me sort of uh, wrap up. So what is a Huns metal? Huns metal is a material where, from the point of view of spin degrees of freedom, you have like an insulator, you have a magnet. But from the point of view of the charge and the orbital degree of freedom, you have an itinerant system. So if you are doing density of states measurements, it looks pretty much like the LDA with some narrowing of the order of three to five 
near the Fermi level. But if you look at the spins, you see essentially something like spin fluctuation spectra, which is essentially localized. Good? And from the point of view of the impurity model, which is a very good way of thinking about it, you should think about all the local eigenstates of the problem. What is the iron doing as a function of time, quantum mechanically, if you write the path integral? And then you see that there are many, 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 many eigenstates of iron which are occupied because this is a metal. It fluctuates from four to five to six to seven, even eight electrons. So we have like 10,000 many body eigenstates which are occupied. But then you see the effects of Mr. Hunt's because in each configuration, there's a spike. And that spike is the Hunt state with maximal spin, which is preferred by the system and gives rise to the spin fluctuation spectra. So with that, I will now go to, uh, I will skip the heavy fermions, and I would like to conclude by telling you really where we are. So what did I try to do in this talk? I'll try to sort of convey to you the idea that this field is still experimentally driven. Even from the 1960s, this has been a source of continuous surprises and discoveries because we're dealing with non-perturbative physics and then non-perturbative things do things you don't expect because your intuition is based on perturbation theory. On the other hand, dynamic mean field theory has done its job. So now we have a zeroth order picture of strongly correlated materials. We have a non-perturbative way of thinking about materials in terms of impurity models with a self-consistent environment that we can solve for. And this is a new way of thinking about materials, which is non-perturbative because this impurity model already contains the physics of the atom, the physics of the band, and all the local RG flow between one to the other. Now, there have been recent technical and conceptual advances in solving and understanding this, these equations. So that's a lot of fun, and that enables us to make a lot of progress with the iron nictites. I focused on the normal state, but of course, now the next step is to go a little bit lower in temperature and look at the, all the possible order states that can occur at lower temperatures. People are, of course, working in extensions of the dynamic mean field theory, which is a very active subject. From a conceptual point of view, we now understand there are different ways in which a material can become correlated. And there is the MOT way, which is due to charge blocking, which requires proximity to a MOT transition. But there's also the Hund's way, which involves the localization of the spin and it's much more general and does not really require fine tuning. It can occur pretty much anywhere in the phase diagram. In both cases, at extremely low temperatures, we can get quasi-particles that emerge, but also we understand why these scales are non-perturbative and they're so small, and now we're not tied to any specific transition. So I think this is sort of a big advance. And now we sort of get them from from the same equations. So the same equations can describe very, very rich behavior, can describe many different materials. And I think there's a very nice way of understanding the physics of materials at all scales by looking at the RG flows of these simple impurity models. And I showed you that now we can produce more or less the same plots as the experimentalists do, so there's much more uh, deeper dialogue between theory and experiments. And we need to, of course, improve the accuracy of the solutions of the DMFT equations to understand what are the what deviations are the results of we're not really solving this properly or we need to improve this theory or we need to go beyond and look at longer wavelength fluctuations which are not included in a mean field theory, just like in critical phenomena, it was deviations from mean field theory which led to the discovery that critical exponents, for example, are controlled by long wavelength fluctuations. And the fact that now we're not so far from experiments brings the question of whether we can use these tools to try to design materials, and there's a lot of push from, from, from various uh, government agencies to try to improve the, the materials discovery process by incorporating theory. 
And my feeling is that for strongly correlated materials, this is very early yet in the sense that the tools are not well developed, but it's still worth pursuing and reminds me of the early days of navigation when, when people were using compasses and say Christopher Columbus tried to find uh, a new path to, to get to India. And the reason why he undertook that endeavor was because he was using completely wrong measurements of the circumference of the Earth. He was off by about a factor of 2.5. So if, if he had not discovered America, he would not have succeeded. But it was a good idea to go there. So in that sense, I think that this, this material design project is worth pursuing. I don't know what we'll find. And we don't have the instruments. But the instruments can actually be made now more precise. And this is sort of a research challenge. And to put things in perspective, people used to say the same thing about LDA, density functional theory, and superconductivity. Superconductivity was also discovered by accident. It was discovered uh, by Camerlis Ons when he was just trying to liquefy helium and discovered something he didn't expect. And then experimentally kept improving the superconducting transition temperature. Took about 50 years for Bardeen, Cooper, and Schrieffer to produce the most successful theory in solid state physics, which is the BCS theory. And this had absolutely no effect on the pace of discovery of materials. This is a straight line. If you want to be mean, you can say that even slow down a little bit the process of discovery. But scientists and experimentalists used to make fun of that. A famous experimentalist, Bern Matthias, who, which was very influential in the state, said that BCS tells us everything but finds us nothing, in the sense that no superconductor was really found using BCS theory. But you know, people persevered, and Walter Kahn came with the density functional framework, and lots of computational physicists worked very hard for decades finding good implementations which are practical, which enabled the calculations more routinely on materials, until eventually this effort pans out. And uh, last year, essentially, the record superconducting temperature, which is 200 Kelvin, was finally achieved. And that was in hydrogen sulfide, and it was done um, in Germany. But the reason why the, the uh, um, Emirates looked at this material is because of a theoretical paper which, using the density functional theory, had scanned all these hydrogen sulfides and point out that this was a very, very promising material. So even though the TC was not perfect, they had predicted something like 80 Kelvin, and this was actually 200, this was a theory-guided discovery and is nicely acknowledged in the experimental paper that the theory came one year earlier. So I think that basically this is sort of a good example. And what should remember that there's a big delay from a conceptual insight to having a practical tool for discovery. And that's where we are in correlated electrons. Now, from a conceptual point of view, what I, what I discussed today should, can be viewed in both ways. Uh, my, my, my advisor, Phil Anderson, always stressed that each level of science should use a completely different language and that somehow the different levels are disconnected. That's the essence of the emergent phenomena. He was very much against trying to bridge between different scales. And then in his view, the role of theory is to look at experiments and generate concepts, ideas, and understanding, and really the, the develop methods and techniques for solving Hamiltonians. But he was very much against this first principles approach that was trying to bridge the atomistic scale and the low energy physics. So that's sort of one view. Then. Uh, the other view is the view of sort of, of Dirac, that uh, he always, he, this quote is very famous. It, it says that, well, after he wrote his book on quantum mechanics, we pretty much can predict chemistry and, and I guess by extension solid state physics, just that the equations are too hard, too complicated to solve. But then in the same uh, article, he goes forward and he says that we should work on solving this problem. And he writes, approximate practical methods of applying quantum mechanics should be developed 
which can lead to an explanation of the main features of complex atomic physics. And here, I guess I would extend that now to complex solids without too much computation. And of course, too much computation depends on the time. When Dirac wrote this, there were no digital computers. Now, too much computation are things that can be done actually in real time and provide guidance. So I think that this is sort of a very worthwhile goal as well. And I think the truth for strongly correlated materials is that both Anderson's and Dirac dictums are both important. And I think that both lines of research should be pursued and they are connected to each other. And what I showed in this talk is that a lot has been gained by sort of being open-minded and followed the two paths. I mean, experiments have told us many things which are qualitative, different ways of thinking about solids, and it would not have been possible without trying to find also first principle methods. So with that, I will thank you very much for your attention. I will thank also the funding agencies and the work, the most recent work I showed with, on the Huns metal were done with Jayu Deng and the group in Munich, Kathy Stadler, Jan Boldalf, and Andreas Weichelbaum. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gabriel. Uh, any question? Hi, thanks for a nice talk. So I'm not a condensed matter theorist. I'm just trying to pick out bits and pieces. But you mentioned at some point that there was this low scale that you were trying to explain the yes. where you get the Fermi liquid. Yes. And you were trying to get there from a high atomic yes. scale. Yes. But then you said that in the end, when you do a calculation, there is no scale invariant fixed point anywhere. Yeah. So that somehow, well, to me, as a high energy physicist, this sounds a bit yes. uh, as a contradiction because usually no, no, we have me, two let scales. Me explain, let me explain exactly what I either there are intermediate scales yeah, 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 or yeah. we have scale invariance. So no, let what, me tell you exactly what's going case? on. So, so, so that 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 uh, that we understand very well now. So we start with uh, we, we, we now I will talk about Huns metal. So, so, so I'm going to talk about the renormalization group flow of this. Okay. So we start with the atomic degrees of freedom, and then uh, at a very high scale, the orbital degrees of freedom go we still have spin degrees of freedom. So here, there, there is essentially an approximate scale invariant regime. Eventually, the spin degree of freedom also gets screened, and that's when the Fermi liquid theory gets built. Because what you, to get a Fermi liquid quasi-particle, you need to put charge, spin, and orbital. You need the three things. If you don't have these three things bound, you cannot really remove an electron as a sharp excitation. So that's your low energy scale. And that's generic. It's tied to the existence of this type of impurity model. You need a moderate U, but you don't need to be close to any specific transition. So it happens in 4D, 5Fs, 3Ds. When you can tune this to the proximity to the mod transition, then these two scales get close and they go down to zero. So Landa was right. Fermi liquid theory is the attractive fixed point, but it only occurs at extremely low temperatures. If you want to drive this thing to zero, something that we're studying now, you need to fine tune, and, but you don't need to because to ex, in experiments, you see more often than not this T square behavior. It's just that this scale is low and we understand now why. And we can describe it in a system-dependent fashion. So I think we're now in good shape. Thank you. Can you tell us a little bit how you, how you deal with the superconductivity? How can you detect? Uh, yeah. So, so there are two ways that one can actually do that. One way would be to proceed and try to compute, for example, vertex functions. So what I said is that the, the, these impurity models can be used to extract irreducible quantities. Here, what we computed is in the particle hole channel, but we could compute the particle-particle susceptibility using the response function of the impurity. In all these materials, the, the superconductivity usually has some D-wave character. So one would need an impurity model which has two or four sites, and that has already been done in the literature for the one-band model, but it has not been done for 
most of the materials which have unconventional superconductivity. But it's a computational difficulty, it's not a conceptual difficulty. And uh, I'm sure that in the next 10 years, this will become routine. That's one way. The other way is the way that uh, you would do when you want to find magnetism. So what you do is now you simply say that we're going to look for order states. So we can have up, down, up, down in a magnet. And then side A is different than side B. And the mean field for A is different than the mean field for B. We can do exactly the same thing and obtain a superconducting state in the order state. And in fact, uh, as a historical thing, I think the first type of calculation of that was done, in fact, here with Werner Kraut and Antoine George. That was the first thing after the dynamic and field, mean field theory was developed. We tried to do precisely that, try to see if we could get superconductivity. The tools were too crude, the temperatures were too high, and we could not find anything interesting in the models we looked at. But it's just a technical problem that now is essentially close to being solved but all the framework is there. Very naive question. So you, you mentioned those new uh, superconducting materials, which, yes. uh, which have uh, a critical temperature around 100 Kelvin, yes. you say. Yes. So what are the prospect of uh, Practical. Do they suffer from the same difficulty or the old high TC? I uh, uh, mean, you don't can have high uh, uh, critical currents, or yeah. are they difficult to? No, actually, these are good. These are slightly better. They have uh, they have uh, much higher critical fields. In fact, people in the magnetic field laboratory in Tallahassee are actually developing one of these families, this uh, this uh, one to two family because they, they have good uh, critical fields. They're more isotropic. Uh, but again, in all these systems that, that have strong Coulomb repulsions, the essence of the strong correlation is that the Coulomb interaction does not renormalize down. So you're still left with some Coulomb repulsion when you form the Cooper pairs. And that forces the Cooper pair wave function to change sign and to have nodes. I think this is sort of generic. And that means that they will never have, by having changes of sign of the order parameter, they will never have as good critical currents as an S-wave superconductor. But these are better than the coupe rates, actually. So the answer is that uh, I don't know yet of any application, but there, there, there are groups commercially funded for that. There have been uh, reports of uh, superconductivity in uh, two layers graphene uh, recently. Yeah. Does this fit in your framework? Well, I think graphene is an example of a weakly correlated material in the sense that I think the, the, the Coulomb interactions are not so strong. But that's my opinion. The, the, they are essentially very close to being semi-metals. And they are very, and the physics there, I think, comes more from the long range Coulomb interactions than from the on-site repulsion that is screened. But People say, people tell me that if you start expanding graphene a little bit, then they can start generating moments. So, so it may not be so far from strong correlations. So the answer is, I, I don't know. My prejudice is no, but it's open problem. OK, let's thank uh, Gabriel again for this talk. Thanks. Okay.